Thanks for tuning in for another in our series, Reading with Dr. Humphreys. In this video, I'd like to focus on Pope Benedict XVI's encyclical, Deus Caritas Est. I'll focus on the first eight sections in this video, and there will be others which will take a look at the remaining sections. It's noteworthy that Pope Benedict chose love as the topic of his first encyclical. He also wrote a later encyclical on hope, and started an encyclical on faith, but did not finish it before he retired. That encyclical on faith became the first that Pope Francis offered to the world, completing the trilogy and reflecting on the sense in which faith is given to us by our elders. But to Pope Benedict and his insistence that we meditate on love, the king of the theological virtues. Well, Pope Benedict opens with perhaps the most direct quotation in all of Scripture about what makes Christianity distinct. It's from 1 John 4. God is love. Now, he summarizes that the heart of the Christian faith, love, is the heart of the Christian faith, the Christian image of God, and the resulting image of mankind and its destiny. Pope Benedict here gets straight to the point in telling us exactly where we need to focus. Later, we should think about what we mean by the word love and how this uh, plays out in all of our thought processes. But what is unique about the Christian God is this sense that God is love. It's more than a sense because it's in Scripture. God reveals to us that God is love. Now, I think there are a number of points that we should make about this initial observation that God is love. First, you know, well, the heart of the Christian faith is love. There's a pun intended here. We're thinking about the heart. But as we move along, I think there's also a sense about what's distinct about Christianity, and in particular here, a Catholic understanding of the faith. We might contrast, you know, the heart of the faith with something like Christianity would be mostly about faith. But here we see Pope Benedict saying Christianity is mostly about love. In this is an implicit critique of any theologian who would attempt to separate faith, hope, and love. Or perhaps we might think of theologians who would say the real heart of Christianity is faith somehow to the exclusion of love. Indeed, with Paul, Pope Benedict observes, in the end, love remains. There's another sense here, which is very important at the outset, and that's the sense in which we're reflecting on the image of God. What is our image of God? And here we have um, multiple things happening. You know, one is the human conception. But the other is God's revelation. And both are intended here in Benedict's meditation that God is love. You know, from the one direction, it's fruitful for us to spend time thinking about human love. The best of human love is in the image of God. On the other side, we should definitely spend time thinking about meditating upon God's revelation of himself as love. We have also in this opening sense the image of mankind and its destiny. Now, here we can think about our understanding of ourselves, what it means to be human, and in particular, what it means to be me. And Pope Benedict is saying, what it means to be you, what it means to be human, is to be in the image of God, who is love. This is in essence, the fundamental orienting principle or thought process that Pope Benedict wants to endorse in his letter. To be in the image of God 
would mean to love. Well, we know where that goes when Jesus is asked this question, even about the law. What is the law? Well, the law is to love God and love your neighbor. These are key principles, and they actually help us integrate all of what we might be tempted to think of as spirituality, the way in which we love God, and morality, the way in which we love our neighbor. We're effectively making an argument that these cannot be separated from each other. We cannot separate our love of God from our love of neighbor. We cannot separate our spirituality from our morality. And if you'll notice very neatly, this is all the doctrine of Christianity. We cannot separate our doctrine and the content of faith from these expressions of love, from our own understanding of ourselves as being created in the image of God's love. There's a fourth point here that I'd like to draw out, and that is our destiny. We are often tempted to think of, you know, all of our understandings of, of society under love of neighbor and morality, and that has a lot to endorse it. But if we missed that, or if we were tempted to think uh, of this as somehow individualistic, we, we would be wrong, right? Created in the image of love uh, must mean in the image of loving another. But if we missed it, Benedict outlines, uh, you know, that, that we have to think about the image of mankind and our destiny. And here we could think, you know, in the short term, so like future generations. But we could also think of the long-term eschatology, getting to heaven. And of course, our ultimate destiny is God's love. This is the heart of Christianity. All right, well, this opening couple of sentences lays out at least four key points for us as we're reading Benedict's encyclical, Deus Caritas Est. Now, Benedict argues that this theme in Christianity, this revelation that God is love, is a theme of continuity and a theme of fulfillment for Judaism. It's, it's a both-and situation. And he, he moves delicately through here. But notice that we quote New Testament 1 John. We quote New Testament John 3, 6, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And then we connect this to Deuteronomy. And in the Deuteronomy, we look at Judaism, which expresses the heart of its existence in the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Now things come, in essence, full circle. What was predicted, in essence, prophetically spoken in the Old Testament law is now fulfilled in the New Testament. There are several ways to chart this, but you know, if we're thinking of the Shema, and this is essentially the first commandment, we're speaking of the Sinai Covenant with Moses. And this moves from the one God directly to love. We have to ask this question, you know, why? Why do we move from the unity of God or the uniqueness of God to love? Now, this is a question which, which Pope Benedict is telling us already exists in ancient Israel. It's a defining point in Israel's existence. It's actually the Sinai covenant, which, which in essence transforms the Hebrew people into the people of God, God's chosen people, the Israelites. They're led by Moses. They wander through the desert, but they end up at Sinai, where they're given a sort of definitive form of the covenant the Ten Commandments that we all know. And, and Jesus references this 
when asked what's the greatest of the commandments, seemingly a legalistic question which is meant to trap him. And Jesus says, return to your roots. The greatest commandment has already been explained for you. It's this, there is one God, therefore you shall love him. And the second greatest commandment, in case you were wondering, you know, Jesus continues, is that you should love your neighbor. But why is this so? Why not take the reflection on one God to something like, God is almighty, God is all powerful, you should submit to him. God is uh, the greatest power. If you try to engage a power struggle with him, you will lose. Why not take it in that direction? All right, well, the Old Testament opens this question. It sets this trajectory or this arc, which is fulfilled in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, in the blood of Christ. That covenant, of course, takes its form definitively so in the Eucharist, but we also recognize that all of the patterns of the incarnation, God coming to us, God remaining with us in the sacraments, are expressions of this God who is love. Now, there's continuity for sure, because the, the ancient form of the covenant on Sinai recognizes the uniqueness of God, the oneness of God, points to the necessity of love. Love is the foundation of this covenant. And yet somehow we do not understand it. Humanity cries out and, and says, I don't get it yet. I feel alone. This, this doesn't answer every question of my existence. And then at the appointed hour at the right time, God sends his only begotten son because he loves the world, because God is love. And of course, humanity cries out, at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, this is the answer for which we have been longing. Well, this theme of continuity and discontinuity between Judaism and Christianity, between an older covenant and a newer covenant, is obviously familiar ground for Christian theologians. Because God is love, and because God loves us, this means that we respond to God's love with love. Now, this is really important because it reframes the entire issue of law in the Old Testament. We're tempted to think, and this is wrong, but we are tempted to think of Old Testament law in this category of things I must do which come from without. They're external constraints. The prophets in, in Israel are continually arguing this is not the case. You, you have moved from the covenant. And that does not mean, you know, just that you're ceasing to obey some sign in the sky, like a speed limit sign, but rather you're not even aligned with yourself because God writes his law on human hearts. But but we don't get it. We we struggle. All right, so I think that reading of law in the Old Testament is a poor reading. I think Torah would better be constructed as a way, a way of life. And well, on this I think Jews and Christians fundamentally agree. What stands in distinction when we start to see it this way is that Christians are able to articulate that God has first loved us. And so God reaches out to us, and God reaches out to us through the law, through Torah, through the incarnation, and gives us this great gift. That's what enables us in turn to reach back up to God. This we recognize as the cycle of blessing in which God gives and we receive so that we can give and God can receive. In other words, God initiates this relationship of love with us and that enables us 
to love God in return. It's precisely this which allows us to fulfill the commandments, to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our might. It's what allows us to love God and to love neighbor in that distinctly Christian way. I'd like to take a little sidebar and contrast this with things that often pop up. We tend in our context, you know, to, to think of leadership in the world, to think of the, the way that we interact with our society in terms, uh, well, which are brutal. But, you know, if, if we think of someone like Machiavelli, uh, right? Now, we're probably all familiar with this. But we know that, that Machiavelli writes this, this treatise on the prince in which he argues, you know, it's better to be feared and loved. I mean, you, you, you have this, this sense that there are two real motivations in human uh, existence. You, you can be motivated by fear or love. And Machiavelli says in the end, you ought to go with fear. Now, he's willing to admit it would be better if you could motivate everyone by love, but it's sort of practically speaking, you cannot. And so you, you have to depend on fear. Fear is a way that you can control other people. Love is a way that you cannot control people. All right, so Machiavelli endorses right, that the leader will need to be feared. And this gets us to the, to the sensibility that we often have, that the ends justify the means. In other words, Machiavelli assumes that the whole world is really a power struggle. And the most powerful is going to win. Again, it would be nice if we could be loved and we could win everything by love, but his premise is that we cannot. Given that we're engaged in this fundamental power struggle, what we need to do is use fear. Fear will motivate everyone else. Leadership needs obedience. I think this is how Machiavelli's argument goes. Leadership needs obedience, and obedience is more easily mastered through fear than through love. This gives us a leadership model based on fear. It gives us an understanding of the universe based on this, the structure of a power struggle. And many of us think about the world in that way. Uh, a related model would be to establish you know, leadership based on punishment. And, and punishment strongly related to fear. But a punishment model might allow for some freedom, right? You know, You get to choose. You can either have merit or demerit. Um, and, and here are the rules of the game, and you play them. But still, that's often fundamentally a power struggle. Notice how fundamentally different the understanding of Christianity is. Christianity argues that while we may begin in fear, we should grow into love. That's the Christian understanding. The Christian understanding is that we're not in some great power struggle with God, but rather that the Almighty fights on our side. I mean, again, God loves us. God loves us first. God gives to us, we receive. That allows us to return to God who is love. This is not a power struggle. A power struggle is when you're aimed in opposite directions. Nope. Pope Benedict is calling our attention to this fundamental dynamic in Christianity, which in essence is fundamentally countercultural. Because God is love, because God loves us, the new covenant is about entering a loving relationship with God. Well, we need to think about what love means as a term. Pope Benedict reviews several uh, understandings of love uh, and, and looks through a couple of definitions. I'd like to use some that are quite familiar to most of us who read C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis gives us, you know, basically, uh, well, four loves, and that's the title of this book, right? Uh, the Four Loves. I think it's a good companion piece to Benedict 
uh, God is love if you were looking for something else to read. Now, in The Four Loves, uh, C.S. Lewis again articulates affection and friendship Eros and Charity. These are the four different kinds of love, the four different major kinds of love, according to C.S. Lewis. Again, I mention this because it's a very popular book. Many people have read it already. If not, uh, I do recommend that you would read it along as a kind of companion piece to help you think through the arguments that Pope Benedict is making. We could add to this several other usages of the verb love. We say in English, I love pizza and I love my dog. Neither of those fit exactly on C.S. Lewis's four definitions, right? There, there are other ways that we use love. Uh, note that, you know, Pope Benedict mentions those, shortens the list, expands the list. There are several ways that we use love. But we very quickly get to this understanding that you know, loving pizza, loving your dog, these things would not express loving your wife or loving your daughter. And, and so we have to account for other senses of love. For Benedict, the easiest way to do this is really the great philosophical tradition <clears throat> of thinking of these two great directions of love. And so Benedict shortens the list and goes very quickly to eros and agape. Now, here Pope Benedict does some incredibly delicate work. We enter territory that's been flagrantly misunderstood and even abused in some of the secondary scholarship. And Benedict carefully and gently corrects some of those scholars. I want to pause here and mark this because, you know, we often think we know what eros means or what agape means, and we're often wrong. So Benedict gives us a pretty clear sense of simply how these words would be used in ancient Greek literature. And, and we have to perhaps suspend some of our own sensibilities about how we think these words work. Eros is an ascending love. And, and this is a key distinction, you know, where agape is a descending love. Now, let's think a little more carefully about what Pope Benedict is arguing here. An ascending love reaches out, and, and it reaches out because it recognizes that the object of its affection is beautiful. So Eros seeks beauty, and when it finds it, it wants a return. It's highly charged. It's passionate. It's emotional. C.S. Lewis does a phenomenal job of describing Eros in a, in a fuller chapter. Benedict also includes in Eros the philosophical sense. We often think of the erotic as like a love that a man has for a woman or a woman has for a man. It's very sexually, romantically charged. That's definitely a deep sensibility of Eros. But there are uh, other uses of Eros to recognize beauty in nature and to be drawn into it, to, to want to go for a hike in the philosophical sense could be understood as erotic because we're pursuing the beauty around us. Now, the agapeic love is thought of as descending because the agapeic seeks the good of another. And sometimes we'd say, you know, Eros would stand face to face. I, I long for your beauty and I want you to long for my beauty. Whereas agape is a parent to a child. 
it's it's not so much that it is disinterested, right? Uh, it is that it is aimed at the other. There's in fact a, a bold move in agapeic love, which is the farthest thing from disinterest, because part of the agapeic dimension of love or direction of love is to recognize that I am good for you, right? This is effectively what parents are, are saying to their children. It's not selfish, but it's also not completely disassociated from the self. When, when a parent takes care of a child, a parent says, I know what is good for you. I have it. I, you must eat your vegetables, right? That's the right thing for you. You must use your manners and, and I'm going to reach out for you. I have a stake in that as a parent, right? So it's not this completely disinterested love. It's a very interested love. The distinction is the direction that agapeic love reaches down to the other in order to give the good, in order to, to offer the other's good and recognizes at the same time that I, the giver, have the good, am good for you. Eros recognizes beauty in the other already and basically says, I want that. All right Now, there are lots of misunderstandings here. We, we need to continue to clarify them with Benedict. But one of the first things is to think that, you know, beauty is somehow not good or that beauty and goodness are somehow not true. And Benedict says, you know, absolutely not. Right? To be attracted to beauty, to realize the value of someone else is a good thing. This is what we have to learn to do to, to interact with society is to, to, in essence, be able to look at someone else and say, ah, this is why you are beautiful. And in a lot of ways, you know, this is what teachers are doing with their students. I, I hear you say this, this is the good part. This is the beautiful part. Focus your energies on this. This is what coaches do with, with their players. Here's your strong start. Here's where you're a beautiful player of this sport. This is where you're a shining athlete. Let's strengthen that. And then also, you know, let, let's highlight the good parts of you. Let's see if we cannot also work to strengthen the weaker parts of you. All right, to be attracted to beauty is a good thing. In fact, because to be attracted to beauty is such a fundamental good for, for human existence, its perversion is an exceptionally bad for human existence. The more a thing is loved, the worse is its betrayal. We know this, that the things that you love or the ones that you love the most are also the things that can hurt you the most because it's, it's opening to this beauty. It's recognizing that you do not have it and you want it, which makes you vulnerable. Everyone loves. Everyone loves. And we love beauty in others. That's good. But that means that we can be betrayed. We can also seek after a false beauty. And in that sense, we betray ourselves as well. Still, Benedict's point, in the garden, love as an attraction to another, a recognition of another's beauty, is at the very heart of the creation of humanity. We see that in God's observation in Genesis 2, that it is not good for humans to be alone. And we see it in Adam's declaration, rising from the deep sleep, at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one is like me. I can love. All right, we also see it in the narrative of Genesis 1, with the sensibility that you could not even imagine humanity apart from sexuality, apart from our uh, difference, which enables us to give ourselves. And we must remember that this capacity to give and receive ourselves is fundamentally a capacity to love, fundamentally a capacity to reach out and recognize the beauty in someone else or to offer the good to another in the agapeic direction of love. All right, in both creation accounts, you know, there, there's an endorsement of Eros. We get the commandments, be fertile and multiply and, and fertility and multiplying, participating and creating the next generation. Well, these are, you know, extremely erotic directions of love. 
and they lead to extremely agapeic directions of love. All right, now we've said agapeic is selfless in the sense that it's descending, it reaches out to help the beloved, but it's not disinterested. Uh, it is like a parent reaching down to a child. Now, the parent isn't seeking a good in return, but but really wants the good for the child, right? I'm here for you. In In truth, probably no human acts with pure intentions. And, and so we can pervert these things and, and at least act on a kind of mixed bag of motivations. But the direction of agapeic love would be to offer the good for another. Now, people think eros and agape are opposed. And, and Benedict notes this, right? People think that eros and agape are opposed because they have different directions and they have different expectations and perhaps even different objects. Benedict argues that they are not opposed. Christianity did not destroy eros. Christianity shows the true meaning of eros. Christianity does not endorse agape over eros, but rather points to the need for both. All right, so why do we think that they are opposed? Well, we think that they are opposed, actually not by looking at them in their, their deepest sensibility, but by looking at their opposites. The opposite of eros is lust. And here we need to think carefully, but the opposite of eros is lust. Now, eros is that love which is deeply attracted to a beautiful other person. If I am a deeply attracted to the beauty of, of some woman, we say, I have eyes only for her. But we often use erotic to mean, I have eyes for any woman. That's lustful. Lust simply seeks uh, a sort of generic beauty wherever you may find it. That's a selfish use of beauty. But Eros sees beauty in the world and, and wanders at it and respects it, desires it for its own sake. All right, so a truly erotic love is highly focused. Remember, it's the intensely passionate love which says, I love you and you alone. Only you will do. Only this beauty answers that hole in my heart, that thing for which I love. All right. Lust is the opposite of eros. Now, in that sense, lust says, I want to use you. I want to abuse you. You are a means to some end, usually some pleasurable end for me. Well, that would certainly be the opposite of agape. That, that would that would be headed in a fundamentally different direction, not because Eros is different from Agape, but the perversion of Eros, lust, is very selfish. Now, the opposite of Agape is a little more difficult to articulate. We don't have a word for it as far as I can tell, but, but the opposite of Agape would be something like a lazy tolerance. Agape says, you need to learn to read, and that means that I need to sit on the couch with you and read to you. And it means I need to patiently point to these letters and help you form out the sounds. It's very difficult when you're an advanced adult reader to slow down and read slowly with a child. It's very difficult when you're a varsity swimmer to kind of slow down and, and, and work on the fundamentals with someone who's just beginning. It's far easier to turn on the TV and say, entertain yourself. It's far easier to pass the buck to someone else and say, ah, go learn elsewhere. I think of agape in another example of, of like the Good Samaritan, of tending to your neighbor who's beaten down. Agapeic love says, I have some good for you and I want the good for you. Here, here is money. Take care of this man. 
Here is my time. I will stop whatever I'm doing, driving down the road, and I will give you my water because it's hot outside and I see you struggling. That's agapeic love. But what are we tempted to do? Well, the opposite of agapeic love is to say, be warm and well-fed and continue walking along. That's not agape. It feels disinterested, but it actually turns out to be lazy tolerance. I see that you are struggling. I see that you lack an understanding, and I cannot be bothered to help you in your struggle. Well, that lazy tolerance, I'll tolerate bad things for you. I'll tolerate evil for you. That is the opposite of agape. And that, of course, would be very different from eros, because eros, even in its kind of lustful sense, is, you know, uh, I want you, here's things that you want, but give me what I want, right? Whereas lazy tolerance is leave me alone. I cannot be bothered. All right. Again, Benedict is arguing that eros and agape are two dimensions or two directions of love. Both are endorsed in their truest sense by Christians. Their opposites are always touted as, as things to avoid. Lust on its own, we should not do. Lazy tolerance on its own, we should not do. And when we think of eros as lust, well, it, it always appears to be the opposite of agape. And when we think of agape as lazy tolerance, it always appears to be the opposite of eros. But that's not actually thinking about the two. So, eros and agape need to be bound together. There are other uh, references in this opening section of Deus Caritas Est, which are quite important. The, the sense of the Old Testament endorsing or rejecting Eros is another one of those hot topic issues. Benedict says the Old Testament in no way rejected Eros as such, but rather it declared war on a warped and destructive form of it because a counterfeit divinization of lust, understood as Eros, strips it of its dignity and dehumanizes it. That's not Eros, right? An undisciplined Eros would not be an ascent into the ecstasy towards the divine, but rather a fall, a degradation. An Eros which lacks focus on some other beautiful, but rather is that generic lust, whatever will please me, that's not helpful. That's a fall away, a degradation of. Evidently, Eros needs to be disciplined and purified, but that does not mean that it needs to be rejected. If we're puzzling over this and thinking, but Eros is not actually endorsed in Scripture, Pope Benedict offers us a few references. The Song of Songs, which remains part of inspired Scripture, part of the Old Testament for Christians. Well, this is, in effect, an exaltation of conjugal love. It's a celebration of that highest expression of eros in which a man and a woman commit to each other. This is part of sacred scripture. There's another observation from Pope Benedict, and that is the observation that scripture itself speaks of God seeking us in an erotic dimension. In the account of Jacob's ladder, Pope Benedict reminds us, the fathers of the church saw the inseparable connection between ascending and descending love, between eros which seeks God and agape which passes on the gift received, symbolized in various ways. In other words, we have to reflect on the way up and the way down. While well, the Song of Songs tells us about erotic love and its importance. Jacob's ladder is also understood as a reference to the erotic, balanced with, fulfilled in the agapeic. And we have many verses which speak of God reaching out to us. The prophetic voice in the Old Testament mentions 
that god wants to lure us into the desert to be alone with us god wants to come to us in flesh and blood that is fundamentally erotic god longing to be with us it also is agapeic in that god's presence with us is in fact the best thing for us true love requires both the seeking of pleasure and the finding of it in eros and the gift of self in agape true love has both the going out the seeking the beauty of the other and the going out the offering the yourself to the other both of these the erotic and the agapeic look for a return in love pope benedict reminds us that eros actually wants to be fulfilled in the self-gift of agape and agape needs the energy the drive the compulsion of eros <laughs> Thank you.